Chauncey, hello. My name is Dan Hurley, Chair of the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance, and welcome to the 14th Annual State of the Island Economic Summit. I want to acknowledge that Bahia operates on the traditional territories of the Kwakwakiwak, Nuchalnut, and Coast Salish peoples. Today I'm joining you from Gabriela Island on the unceded territories of the Snenemo peoples. Now normally our summit is held in Nanaimo, right over there. But since that is not possible this year, we welcome you from all over Vancouver Island region to join us for this virtual summit. We have an exciting lineup of speakers and roundtables over the next three days, and we hope that you take advantage of as many of those as possible. One of IEA's key roles is to bring decision makers like you together in dialogue to solve problems and to leverage opportunities. We aim to make the Vancouver Island region a more vital and sustainable place to live, to learn, and to do business. This has never been more important than right now. During this time of COVID, Bahia is committed to providing advice and support to all of our members and our partners. We encourage you to learn more about Bahia's activities, initiatives, and how to become a member. For more information, please visit bahia.ca. And now, to learn more about what's in store over the next three days, please welcome the Chair of the 2020 State of the Island Economic Summit Committee from MNP in Nanaimo, Peter Van Dungen. Peter, over to you. Thanks, Dan. When we first started planning this year's summit back in February, I asked our committee members to describe what the summit means to them. One person summed it up beautifully when he said this, the summit is not an event. It's a tool for bringing people together. It's about how to make our island better. Clearly, the world has changed since that day. And while the format of this year's summit may be different, our goals remain the same to deliver timely, relevant insights about our region within a global context, to spark critical thinking, problem solving and collaboration about our most important issues, and to provide a forum to build relationships and partnerships. In short, it's about driving conversations that make our island better. Adapting to a virtual delivery format was not without its challenges. We owe a great deal of thanks to the many people who came together to make this summit possible. Thank you to our summit committee who volunteered their time to help us navigate a new direction. A special thank you to our program committee who did a phenomenal job adapting our program to ensure it remained relevant amid massive uncertainty and change. Thank you to our sponsors for trusting in our ability to deliver value in a new way. Thank you to George Hansen and the entire team at the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance who conquered a very steep learning curve to reinvent the summit in a virtual format. And finally, thanks to you, our delegates, for choosing to participate. This year's summit will be different, no doubt. There's no replacing the face-to-face -face connection that is so fundamental to our human experience. But I encourage all of us to embrace this as an opportunity to learn something new, to ask ourselves, what does this make possible? Together, we will chart a path forward and make our island better. With that, I'll pass things over to George Hansen, President of the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance. Thank you, Dan and Peter. You know, someone the other day humorously said to me, I'm tired, I, I need to get a break. March 12th has been a long day, no kidding. You know, rooted in months of persistent uncertainty with still no relief in sight, our anxiety is bound to temper our confidence and deepen our stress. I know I'm tired. I think we're all tired. The course of our lives has changed and will continue to change. And we humans, we don't like change very much. We especially don't like change that we don't choose. And yet, here we are. You know, on Canada Day this year, I felt especially proud and happy to be Canadian and to be living through all of this here on Vancouver Island. This is not to say that the impact of our lives has not been significant, much more harsh for some than others, but in comparison to most other places in the world, we here in the island region, at least thus far, have been spared the worst. We should consider ourselves lucky and we can use this luck 
to increase the vitality and sustainability in our economy. Changes we can choose. What if we, what if we can find solutions to the problems we thought couldn't be fixed because doing so would be too disruptive? We all know that we have problems worthy of our best efforts. And since we're already disrupted, why not think and work together like never before? This summit can be a beginning point for a new era in our engagement. I'm glad you are here and I'm happy to invite you to take full advantage of this grassroots opportunity to help shape the future of our economy. And now it's my distinct pleasure to welcome the Right Honourable Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. Hi everyone, bonjour à tous, and welcome to the 14th annual State of the Island Economic Summit. First, I want to thank the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance for bringing us together to talk about the future. Your advocacy has helped build strong communities and businesses across Vancouver Island, and your work is incredibly important now as we deal with the impacts of COVID-19. I also want to thank everyone who's joining us today. I know this has been a difficult time for our local economies, and I know that many of you have faced unprecedented challenges throughout the pandemic. I want you to know that we're here to help. When the pandemic first hit, we immediately took action to protect businesses, safeguard our economy, and provide support directly to Canadians so that they could weather this crisis. We created the wage subsidy to help employers keep Canadians on the payroll, brought in the Canada Emergency Response Benefit so families could keep food on the table, and helped businesses stay afloat and cover operating costs with interest-free loans through the Canada Emergency Business Account. And as we work towards rebuilding from the pandemic, our government will continue to help Canadians and businesses through this crisis for as long as is necessary. That's why our government announced the new Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy to provide easy to access commercial rent support and provided an additional rent subsidy top up of 25% for businesses that have had to temporarily shut down due to public health orders. We also expanded the Canada Emergency Business Account and extended the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy until June 2021. Parce que nous ne pouvons traverser cette période difficile que si nous travaillons ensemble et si nous nous entraidons. Through the determination and dedication of Canadians like all of you, folks who know that we can create a healthier, greener, fairer and more competitive Canada, we will get through this challenging time and we will build back better. Merci à tous et bon sommet. Prenez bien soin de vous. Thank you, Prime Minister. And now I'd like to turn it over to our session moderator, Joe Perkins, anchor for Czech TV. Thanks, George. Before we bring in our first speaker for this year's summit, a quick word from one of this year's sponsors, Vancouver Island University. Hello, my name is William Litchfield and I'm the Associate Vice President of Community Partnerships at Vancouver Island University. At VIU, we take a student-centered approach to education with our small class sizes and focus on the professor-student relationship. We're also all about, as my title suggests, community partnerships, working with local businesses and organizations to solve real-world problems and work towards a more prosperous future for all. It's my pleasure to introduce Kate O'Neill, founder and CEO of KO Insight, who also likes to put humans and our relationships with one another first in everything she does. Kate is a strategist and futurist who is helping businesses and humanity prepare for change at exponential scale, such as emerging tech, big data, and climate change. She's dedicated to guiding businesses and civil leaders to be both successful and respectful with human-centric data and technology and helping people better understand the human impact of emerging technologies. Through KO Insights, a strategic advisory and consultancy firm, Kate has traveled the world speaking, writing, and advising and advocating for the future of humanity in an increasing tech-driven world. She was among the first 100 people to be employed by Netflix, where she was the company's first content manager and helped implement innovative, dynamic e-commerce practices that became industry standard. She has also developed Toshiba Canada's first intranet, led cutting-edge experience optimization work at magazines.com, and has held leadership and advisory positions in a variety of digital content and technology startups. 
We're delighted to sponsor this keynote talk and excited to learn more from her experiences with connecting people through technology and creating human-focused digital experiences. It is certainly a topic we at VIU, with our current hybrid model of education delivery, are focused on. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this year's Vancouver Island Economic Summit. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Joe Perkins from Czech News, a proud sponsor of this year's summit. I've been asked to moderate a couple of presentations this year, and I'm honored to get things going with our first keynote presentation of the day. Following this presentation, we will have a question and answer segment to dive a bit deeper into what you hear this morning. Our first speaker is a best-selling author. She's a strategic advisor. She's been named to the 2020 Thinkers 50 list, a global ranking of top management thinkers. And she's a leading voice on how you can make technology better for your business and the people you work with. Cities and businesses all over the world are facing more challenges than ever right now. And the question is, how do these organizations, your organizations, use technology in a way that helps the business, but also helps the people in it, and in turn, the world? It's a big question, but one we'll get some answers to today. Again, welcome to the Vancouver Island Economic Summit for 2020. And here is Kate O'Neill, the founder of KO Insights. Hello, humans. <laughs> hey, um, let me begin by addressing the elephant in the room. I'm not Canadian. Uh, I'm not from Vancouver Island. I'm not even from the proper coast. <laughs> I've been to Vancouver a few times, but never to Vancouver Island. It's a, it's a bummer not to be there in person. I did do my research though. I, I read a lot about Vancouver Island. I watched a lot of videos. And I even tried my hand at making vegan Nanaimo bars. So I think it, it could be said that I did everything I could reasonably do to try to, you know, sort of simulate the big, uh, piece of the experience that I might have had with you in person while, while there, while here in my apartment in Manhattan. And don't get me wrong, I love living in New York City. It's just that part of the reason why I live here, why I chose to live here, is because I uh, normally travel a lot. Sometimes you get to travel to lots of fun, interesting places, but not always. And it feels like a really great place to come home to. And speaking of home, have you ever stopped to wonder what that word home really means? Have you ever stopped to think about it? I think a lot about the meaning of place. And home might perhaps be the first concept of place that any one of us develops. We all know what home is because that's where we grew up. Maybe we think of the house or the neighborhood where we grew up or the town, or maybe even the country. However you think about home, as you spend the next few days thinking about the state of the island and the future of Vancouver Island, I'd encourage you to spend some time reflecting on the meaning of the place and what it means to those who live there and work there and spend their time there. In fact, that's the way I'd like to organize this discussion, thinking about the way we experience place in terms of where we live, in terms of where we work, where we play or shop or any of the other activities we do in a place, and then how data and technology figure into helping us enhance the experiences we have of meaning in that place. And we can think about what aspects of the place do you want to invest in, build up, make more equitable and make more accessible. And we can think about what the place will look like in the future as the world becomes even more connected and work more remotely distributed. One thing about living in New York in 2020 is that I've had a close-up view of living in the middle of what was for a while the center of a global public health crisis when it was the worst in the world here. It was grim. But even in the worst weeks of this past spring, 
And even in the uncertain months that followed, even as people continually speculated about how many people would be fleeing the city, moving out of the city, one thing was still pretty clear to me, that New York means a lot to a lot of people. And anywhere that means that much to so many people is probably going to recover, eventually. At any rate, COVID has been an object lesson in the meaning of place, because it's really been demonstrating the push and pull of local versus global. We know that remote and distributed work, for example, has been substantially on the rise due to COVID-19, and you know before that as well, but really significantly as a result. Some companies have even closed their entire offices or headquarters and are encouraging their entire teams to work from home. And there have been various approaches from cities and regions around the world to how to manage closing businesses and public services versus public health versus the economy versus, you know, all the different factors that are in balance there. Some of those approaches have been a little hard to watch, frankly. There's a thing my friend Bennett Bennett said on Twitter. Yes, that's really his name. He said, feed the block first. And that struck me as an incredibly profound thing to say, and true everywhere, that if we want scalable, sustainable recovery, we have to focus on those closest to us and the resources closest at hand, while not losing sight of the global picture. I've been thinking a similar thing for a few months now, as I've watched cities and regions around the world struggle to prioritize business recovery alongside public health. This phrase keeps popping into my head, the economy is people. No economic recovery strategy makes any sense that doesn't acknowledge that people need to be healthy and whole in order for economic measures to reflect that in any stable or sustainable way. The economy is not the stock market, per se. It's not the jobs market alone. And it's not how quickly regions reopen their industries for business. The economy is people. And the place, too, at some level, is people. And that's part of what makes a place feel meaningful, is people. You know, different kinds of places serve different purposes in relation to people and experiences and culture. A museum, for example, holds space for an idea, and that's a really important function. But we use the built environment in different ways to enhance meaning for people. And we can use data and technology in the built environment as a way of enhancing meaning for people, too. Why do I keep talking about meaning? You may be wondering. <laughs> well, let me let you in on a little secret. While what I research, uh, write about, and speak about on its surface may look like it's about technology, what it's really secretly about is the future of human meaning. You know, because I'm so interested in what it is that makes humans human, and what we need from our surroundings, from our activities, from our interactions with each other, in order to feel a sense of purpose and connectedness. I would argue that meaning seeking and meaning making are two of the most human traits of all. See, meaning as humans conceive of it happens across layers. At the sort of base level, we could talk about semantic meaning, which is sort of the, the way we encode meaning into what we say in language. And at the most macro, big picture level, we can think about cosmic and existential meaning. You know, those big, universal, timeless questions of what's it all about and why are we here? But there's a whole lot in between those two extreme ends of the meaning spectrum, so to speak. You've got, you know, uh, relevance, significance, pattern finding, purpose and truth, and all sorts of other things. And these are all part and parcel of what we are talking about when we use the term meaning or talk about things being meaningful. What's interesting to me is that in all the time I've been studying, the decades that I've been studying meaning, is that at every layer that humans perceive meaning, meaning is always about what matters. And here's an interesting thing, because we're talking about data and technology at some level, when we think about innovation, one way to talk about innovation is to talk about what is going to matter. 
So that's a really interesting set of, of paradigms, of questions. So I want to offer you these two questions as tools to use over the next few days of this conference. Those two questions uh, you can use as lenses, two lenses to look at everything that you hear about and talk about and learn about through during these next few days and everything afterward too. So what is meaningful and what is innovative? In other words, what matters and what is going to matter? And then in addition to that, here are two more tools that I want to offer you. And that is any time that you hear someone talk about data. In your mind, think about people. Because as we'll talk about in a little while, data in many cases represents the needs and movements and behaviors of people. And any time you hear someone talk about technology, in your mind, think about human experience because so much is wrapped up in the human experience of the technology. And when you think about data and you think about technology and you're thinking about people and you're thinking about human experiences, make sure you're thinking about how you can make those human experiences more meaningful for people. We already touched on home as a starting point for the concept of place and the meaning of place. But I want to explore further how a place like a region relates to the different ways that people there live, work, shop, and play, and how we can use data and technology in the natural and built environments to enhance the meaning of the experiences people have in those places. So like I said, I want us to think about the meaning of place as it relates to the way people live and work and play. And so let's talk a little bit about work, the future of work. It's a really big topic because COVID-19 has definitely introduced a few wrinkles into that discussion. Now there is, and always has been a difference between work and the workplace. So there's a difference between the future of work and the future of the workplace. And that's become a little clearer thanks to some of the changes that have come about with COVID-19. So there's the workplace, which is wherever you are right now, which is maybe at home, maybe at your kitchen table, maybe on your sofa, maybe in your bed. I don't judge. And then there's the more official workplace, which is understood to be the center of the work, the office, the headquarters, the campus, what have you. That workplace has a whole new set of requirements, thanks to the pandemic, related to its ability to provide for the teams that need to be together, to facilitate their safety, to monitor their safety, to make it simple for teams to efficiently gather when they need to be in person, but then be able to get their meetings done and then get out so that they limit their time of exposure to one another. So clearly COVID has forced some big changes around remote and distributed work and the future of the workplace in that regard. But it's also forced some big changes and discussions around what is essential work. And it isn't necessarily the stuff that can be done remotely or in distributed teams. It isn't necessarily knowledge work, quote unquote. For example, janitorial and other cleaning jobs become critical during a pandemic. And there's only so many of those that we can entrust right now to say robotic systems. The larger lesson here is that this pandemic is just one form of exponential change that's affecting us all. But collectively, we actually face quite a few exponential changes in the road ahead. There's climate change, huge exponential change. There's the whole AI and emerging technology discussion. And then there's the fallout of geopolitical upheaval. And all of these things are happening in combination with each of these other things. So it's critical that we think in an integrative way to be able to build effective workplaces and businesses and careers for the future that is emerging. So there's a difference, as we've discussed, between the future of work and the future of the workplace. But there's also a critical distinction at play in the language used around the future of work and the future of jobs. 
Here's what I've noticed. The discussions about the future of work have mostly to do with what employment looks like from an employer-oriented lens. What are the roles? What kind of benefits will people expect? How will work groups function across distributed locations and with increasingly automated components? And so on. Meanwhile, the discussion about the future of jobs are driven by individuals and not companies. And they express very different, very human anxieties related to earning a living, providing for oneself and one's family, and so on. People tend to wonder, what jobs might we each be doing in 5, 10, 20 years? What are the skills we need for those jobs to remain competitive in an increasingly global, not to mention increasingly automated, workplace? Mostly, these questions boil down to, how can we make sure that robots won't take our jobs? Or if they do, how can we ensure that billions of people won't be left to face homelessness and hunger? Or that we won't, and we know it sounds bananas, but we kind of have to ask, end up as servants to robots. Because it no longer sounds alarmist to say that at least some parts of our jobs are likely to be displaced and replaced by uh, automation or cognitive computing. In fact, depending on which forecast you consult, as many as half of all job categories risk complete replacement by machines. So we know there are going to be impacts on people's employment, as well as on the economy and on production, on efficiencies of scale and on innovation. We just don't really know what any of that looks like yet. But as always, we can get a sense of the future by looking at the past and where it leads us. Under decades of increasing pressure from shareholders, competitors, and an ever more global marketplace, companies have tended to pursue greater profits and greater growth by continually investing in more efficient methods of achieving results. So if that leads to, say, offshoring to regions where cost of living is significantly lower so that the company can pay significantly less in wages, the thought has been, so be it. And if that now points to subsidizing or replacing huge chunks of human labor with automation or robots or other machines, this mindset again suggests, so be it. It's starting to sound like a pretty gloom and doom forecast for human workers, right? Well, maybe, but not so fast. Because one factor that complicates that narrative is a trend best characterized in August 2019 when Business Roundtable put out a statement saying that the purpose of a company is not just to make a profit, but rather that companies share a fundamental commitment to all of their stakeholders. Which is a position I've argued for some time. And another thing, that offshoring trend of the last 10-15 years or so is itself likely to be reshaped substantially by automation over the next three to five. And in that case, many of these what are largely call centers will be augmented by increasingly automated systems. And what happens with that is that the opportunity shifts. Now the most innovative companies will be trying to figure out how to integrate human call specialists and supervisors into that automated system. And the work that will fall to humans will increasingly be the tasks that require emotional agility and strong communication and language skills. It's a complex picture. But it's important to note that adding automation to the workforce doesn't necessarily mean that human jobs become eliminated. It means machines will continue to augment human jobs, which is what they've done ever since there have been machines, from drills to calculators to mainframes and beyond. Granted, it would be intellectually dishonest not to state clearly that the scale here is very different. And it is true that the rapidly growing capabilities of automation are making it increasingly possible to displace and replace the tasks of human workers. But the essence of the equation is still, machines are built to take on tasks, whether for efficiency or for accuracy or for safety. And then the set of jobs that we do changes as a result. So the main impact of automation and robots is augmentation of jobs, of work, of the workplace. In other words, the overall direction of the concerns that people feel about the future is totally reasonable, but it is a little more nuanced than robots are taking our jobs. Since we know that as emerging technology augments human jobs, we will also create new and sometimes more interesting human jobs. 
that last point is something we don't talk about often enough. And I think it's because people have such a hard time envisioning those jobs. So how can we help humans anticipate those jobs and prepare for them and adapt to them when neither they, nor in many cases we, can even see what they are? Well, it is for sure going to take new skills in new combinations, but they're not all totally mysterious. As we look ahead in the relatively near term, one thing is clear. There's going to be a need for emerging skills in the workplace to manage combined teams of humans and machines. So let's say that the future of work from a business standpoint is automation and robots and algorithmic optimization, and that human involvement is tuning and improving and aligning. What does that look like in practice? Well, it's going to mean using some very human skills that all of us already have to some degree. And if we look at work as a marketplace, not just of jobs to be done, but of value to be added, it becomes a little more clear where humans have a promising future. After all, jobs to be done are discrete, identifiable units of labor that can be executed by anyone or anything. So we can expect those kinds of tasks to be easily automated. But the judgment it takes to size up a situation and break it down into its component tasks is often more complex and more nuanced and more subjective. Traits which, for the moment, are more in line with human capabilities than machine. And there is arguably always more value that can be added to a function or a service or a product or anything by imbuing it with meaning, which is again, something humans are better poised to do than machines. One concern I have when I think about exponential change is that as experiences become increasingly automated, and are increasingly selected for automation by how mundane they are, that we will increasingly be surrounded by automated, mundane, and meaningless experiences. All right, let me give you an example. How many of you are familiar with Amazon Go? It's a reasonably new store concept. Amazon launched in 2018, had its first store in Seattle. It's a physical retail store, and they have them in lots of cities now. Some of you may have been. It's a regular grocery store in every way, except that it doesn't have cash registers. Or, more to the point, it doesn't have cashiers. Instead, you sign up using an app on your phone, and it has this sort of QR code thing that you scan in and as you pass through the opening gates. And once you come into the store, you just gather up everything you want while um, cameras and sensors and a whole constellation of technology is watching you and keeping track of everything you take off the shelf. <laughs> and then when you're done, you just walk back out through the gates. And as you pass through those gates, it virtually you know, rings you up tallies up everything that you've collected as you've been in the store, and it charges it to whatever credit card you've got on file in the app. It's pretty cool, actually. Really useful and simple, and a really compelling idea. It certainly raises questions about the future of human work for cashiers, and that's a really valid and important question, but for the purposes of this exact illustration, I'm just going to sidestep that issue and focus on something else. Because when, when you open the app for the first time, you get a little tutorial on how it works. And it says, because you're charged for everything you take off the shelf, don't take anything off the shelf for anyone else. Now, does that raise any flags? Any red flags for anyone in the room, in the virtual room? <laughs> Go ahead and type Y for yes into the chat right now. If you have ever asked someone to help you get something off of the shelf, or if someone has ever asked you to get something off the shelf. Everywhere in the world I've ever talked about this, and I ask people to show hands, 
it's a nearly universal phenomenon. Like whether we're in, whether in the U.S. or Europe or Hong Kong or India, it's a nearly universal human phenomenon. It's sort of a charming human experience of sharing and helping each other. In fact, it's so common a human experience that not too long ago I was re-watching the movie Double Indemnity and there's a scene in which as Fred McMurray and Barbara Stanwyck are conspiring to cover, cover up a murder, and I'm sorry if that's a spoiler, but this is an 80 year old movie people, so catch up. Anyway, as they're conspiring, a random woman approaches the, they're in a, a grocery store and a random woman approaches and asks Fred to reach the baby food that's on the top shelf. So what if this had been an Amazon Go store in 1944? <laughs> and you know, if she'd asked him, to reach that baby food, he would have had to have said, you know, I'm sorry, lady, I can't help you with whatever. <laughs> a very good Fred McMurray impersonator. But he wouldn't have had to say that because she wouldn't have asked him because they would just know, right? In Amazon Go, we're going to just know that we can't ask each other for help. So that's fine. Maybe we learn that. Maybe we adapt and you know we just don't ask each other for help when we're in an amazon go store but how many of you were sitting here as i was talking about that and thinking huh you know amazon owns whole foods yeah yeah so that's another you know somewhere around 475 stores and then at the end of 2018 Amazon announced plans to open as many as 3,000 Amazon Go stores by 2021. 3,000! And 2021, that's literally, like, that's right around the corner. Now, of course, the pandemic may have changed those expansion plans. But now, in the last few months, Amazon has actually been offering its Go technology as a platform for other retailers to use. So if it wasn't clear already from this illustration, it should be abundantly clear that that is going to become the future of retail, or at least one of the paradigms of the emerging future of retail. And so what I said before about like, we just learned not to help each other in Amazon Go stores, well, then we're just not helping each other in any store, right? And bear with me on this little thought experiment, but I wonder if we do adapt and learn not to help each other in stores, how long do you think it would take before we became socialized to the idea that we just don't help each other anywhere at all? And you may say, Kate, that's a little extreme. That's hyperbolic. It'll never get to that point. And I'll say, okay, fair enough. And, and maybe, you know, Amazon fixes this limitation before it rolls out any further. And I like the just walk out experience overall. I think it's a really smooth and, and slick experience. I think it's a good future of retail experience for the most part. But the point isn't limited to this specific example. The point is how one design decision in an automated experience in an increasingly technology driven world at this kind of scale can potentially change human culture because experience at scale does change culture. You know why? Because experience at scale is culture. So even if we're not tasked with building anything nearly as vast and potentially culture changing as Amazon Go, we are all making decisions about how to integrate data and technology into place, into the built environment or the natural environment, into how people experience the world around them and the people around them. So it's important that we now, in the early stages of automating human experiences, encode those experiences with all the human values we can. And by the way, if you're not aware, you should be aware that algorithmic and automated experiences by and large are known to be encoded with the values and biases of their builders. So when I say encode them with all the human values we can, I mean also with all the enlightenment and all the equity and all the egalitarianism and all the evolved thinking that we can.
had the opportunity a few years ago to go to Amsterdam and present a vision of a human-centric model for the metropolis of the future. They prefer the term metropolis to city. So city of the future, metropolis of the future, region of the future, whatever works. What was so inspire inspiring and exciting about that is that Amsterdam is approaching its 750th birthday in 2025. So like all of us, when we're approaching a milestone birthday, I wanted to look and feel its best. So it started thinking about all the ways that it wanted to improve before hitting this milestone and identified seven pillars along which they wanted to improve. And a few of them were really related to my work, like, you know, tech talent recruitment and smart city sort of deployment and things like that. And AI thinking about how to integrate uh, intelligence into the city for the good of its inhabitants. So I got to present this dimensional idea of how to build data into infrastructure and systems in a way that exposes what's meaningful for people. Take, for example, public transportation and the opportunity to use the built environment and integrate with the built environment in ways that surface meaningful and relevant context about when's the next train coming, for example, how long's a journey going to be between different stations. Uh, a lot of technology that many cities have embedded in bus shelters and train stations, but surfacing this in ways that was just in time and contextual and being able to make it as meaningful as possible for people. In general, that's how we should be thinking about data and immersive technologies, is how can we surround the human with meaningful, relevant context and help them make decisions and navigate a space and enjoy their surroundings. There's a huge opportunity for using data and spatial experiences for both the natural and the built environment. There are certainly opportunities to embed data within a built environment for navigation. And you see this opportunity a lot for something, say, like a hospital, where you may have someone who's visiting a loved one who's in a room in a hospital and doesn't know how to navigate the complex wings of the hospital, but using context-aware uh, signage and navigation cues, you can help somebody uh, using the technology of their their phones or whatever devices they have to help them get where they need to go and have the most relevant information provided to them in as useful a way as possible. You see opportunities with code compliance checking or visualization or a lot of other kinds of ways to use data and immersive technology in the built environment, in new buildings and uh, new developments. And then in the natural surroundings, I had the opportunity to speak last year with the Yale Forestry and Environmental Services Department and give a guest lecture in their, their uh, department. I got to hear about some of the projects that the students were taking on, uh, exploring uh, oceanography or studying animal populations in some part of the world and how they can use data in ways that provide meaningful insight back. In too many of the discussions about data and emerging technology, we tend to think only about commercial use and, and consumerist use of data and technology rather than how we can actually solve human problems at scale. And look, no one is saying that 2020 hasn't been a whole mess of stuff to deal with. It certainly has. In fact, a, a corporate client had me do a virtual event with them for their whole company uh, that they were calling a fireside chat. You know, this is really common term that we use in the industry when we're talking about a, an interview type of format. So it was a fireside chat. And just for the fun of it, <laughs> I know that many of you will recognize the, uh, the meme that this image comes from. I had to, I just had to create this <laughs> as my, my uh, image for the, the show, for the virtual fireside chat. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're in the middle of a lot of this is fine sort of <laughs> weirdness. But funny, here, funny thing about the future is that most of the time that we talk about the future in culture, we have two lenses to look at the future through. It's either dystopia or we talk about utopia. But the reality is no one expects utopia, so we can just rule that out of the equation altogether, right? All we're talking about then is shades of dystopia, which is a really bleak way to think about our future. So I propose that this dystopia versus utopia framing 
is harmful, it just doesn't help at all, and that we could just abandon it and instead think about the future as uncertain and something that we create every day with the actions that we take. The future is uncertain. And that can feel very scary, but there are things that we can do to lay in place a better future, the, the chances of a better future for us and for everyone. You know, artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies are notable for the vast scale and capacity that they will bring. And many times when people think about AI and emerging technologies, they think mostly about commercial contexts, which is okay. But I think that we are underestimating the potential of these technologies if we limit them or constrain them to the commercial realm only. I think we have the opportunity to actually align what we do from a business objective standpoint with human objectives and human outcomes. One framework I think is a really helpful roadmap for this is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Those 17 goals that have been identified that lay out what's needed to improve the quality of life for every human on Earth. And not just every human, actually, all the living beings on Earth. The exciting thing is to think about that set of goals as a roadmap for emerging technologies. There are plenty of opportunities within those goals to develop emerging technologies to bring them to scale, to solve human problems at scale. I, I created a, a collection of headlines, for example, these are just uh, AI proofs of concept that I see in headlines. So over the last few years, whenever I've seen a new story about, you know, some kind of AI experiment that's trying to solve some form of human good, I've rolled that into this slide. I've color coded uh, those headlines or you know, the sort of summary of the headlines to match the sustainable development goal that it most aligns with. And you can see that there's a tremendous amount of momentum that could come from really thinking about how could we use emerging technologies to solve human problems in alignment with what's already been identified as the direction we need to go. And there are plenty of commercializable opportunities within this set of ideas. What's important is that we try to create a future of place and work and jobs and workplaces that promote the efficiency of technology, sure, but also the best and most meaningful characteristics of humanity, like compassion, understanding context, helping each other, 
and using good judgment. Remember, we're facing simultaneous exponential changes from a variety of sources. It's bigger than any of us. So we've all got to be in this together. And the more we align business incentives and human values, the better the chance that rather than accidentally automating meaninglessness at scale, we can instead build the meaningful experiences of the future in our jobs and beyond our jobs and in the places where we work, live, Kate O'Neill, thank you for that presentation. That was wonderful. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Good to see you. It's good to see you. Uh, for our attendees, if you have a question for Kate, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. We have about 15, 20 minutes, so we'll, we'll ask Kate some questions. I think, Kate, I, I'd like to start. It's not every day that I get the chance to talk to someone who lives in, in New York City, <laughs> and that is uh, ground zero right now, unfortunately, for this pandemic. So while we, we get some questions in the queue, uh, perhaps a personal one about what life has been like living, um, living in New York. You know, it's funny. I think it was more ground zero back around sort of April, May time frame uh, when it really hit us, uh, where I think, I think it caught the world a little bit by surprise when... Uh, at least within the U.S., we were looking toward China to, to uh, mitigate the influx. And it was actually already in Europe and coming to New York from Europe. So around um, April or May, we really had it bad, as, as you've seen, I'm sure, with the numbers. Um, and uh, it, was, it was definitely a very, you know, surreal and weird and difficult time for many people. But I think, you know, we really got it together in New York, uh, pretty well since then. There's been a lot of mask compliance. Uh, the the um, policies that have come into place since then, uh, led at the local level and at the state level, have have both been very um, very agile and very aware of the data and of the science. So I'm very fortunate that that um, you know we've stayed healthy. My my family has stayed healthy, and uh, we've been able to stay in the apartment <laughs> and keep, keep connected with the outside world through uh, interactions like this. So as much as I would so much love to be in Vancouver Island right now, uh, having this conversation with you face to face on a stage, <laughs> it's, uh, it's lucky, I think, that we have the technology at this point to be able to, to adapt and do this kind of thing. I think everyone would love to be able to do this uh, like we have in past years, but you know, kudos to the organizers for getting this thing uh, up and running. This is pretty neat. That so far, I mean, first presentation, we're about uh, forty-five minutes in, and no problems. So this is <laughs> this is good. Um, we've got some questions coming yeah. in. I wanted to, you know, the I thought the Amazon example was an interesting one because I think you're right. Um, Grocery shopping is something everyone can relate to. I think the future of um, that shopping experience is going to change. And we're already starting to see, not too much on the island yet, but this practice of you go in, your credit card's already on file, you pick up right. what you want, you leave. And, and as you were saying it, you know, I understand that cutting down on that human interaction can be a negative thing. But there was a part of me that thought, you know what? There's a reason they're doing this, and it's for the ease of the experience. It's to speed things up, right? And so sure. could it be the flip side to that, to play devil's advocate, if, if our retail experiences like Amazon Go are okay. quicker and faster, um, that leaves more time for other more genuine personal experiences. It can. It can. And I think that's been the mindset, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that the idea has been to approach automation with this sort of um, governance of what's mundane and what's tedious and what's, you know, sort of repetitive and what can we automate that we can sort of eliminate that from the slate of tasks that we have to do so that in theory, we could turn our attention to more meaningful work or work that requires more uh, or, or interactions or tasks or whatever, like shopping, that, um, that require more of a judgment call or, you know, more awareness of context or circumstance. And I think there's some truth to that. But as I mentioned, I think that also if you try to imagine forward from uh, with that paradigm where all we've really automated around us are meaningless 
functions and where everything that's automated is starts from a place of mundanity. I think that, you know, it, that very quickly begins to look a little dystopian. So we, we have to balance this mindset. And I think it's, it's a fair, uh, it's a fair consideration to think about the trade-off of convenience and time and, you know, seamlessness and um, frictionlessness and that sort of thing. And I, as I said, I, I really like the, the just walk out concept. I think there are a lot of these kinds of automated experiences that are going to give us back some time and some convenience. I think it's just important that we're also asking the question alongside that of what are those trade-offs that we're making. And if one of those trade-offs is, you know, we don't, we're not able to have a human interaction like, hey, can you reach me that baby food on that shelf? Mm -hmm. Because it will charge us. And that's a that just becomes sort of subtracted from the kinds of experiences that we can have. I, I don't know that we're not poorer for it. And I think it's an important thing just to ask in, in sort of a philosophical way. So I think those are all just considerations that belong on the table, not to say that one thing is, you know, inherently more important than the other, but I think these are, these are rich nuanced conversations that need to be part of imbuing our surroundings with technology. I think the, the bigger tech trend right now that is, is playing out in this pandemic, and this is to Doug Lang's point. He, I'll, ask, I'll read his question. He says, work is a part of a person's community with many people now being required to work from home. Their community has been reduced. What will this do to a person's mental health? And I think he's right. I mean, we talk about the value in human experiences. And this is something any business owner right now and, and many of the people watching are, are dealing with. They, they're leaders of companies that are being forced to cut down for health reasons on mm -hmm. personal interaction. So everything you're saying is great. And I think they, they agree, you know, mm -hmm. we need to have human face-to-face -face experiences. So right. how do you do that right now in a world right. where we're told uh, it's not safe to do so, we sure. can. And, and, and much of the work we're doing is on Zoom. And, and the next point is, it seems to be working. People like the, the Zoom experience, a lot of them. It's it's more efficient. So there's a couple of things happening. I'll let you answer. Yeah, sure. So I think I think there are a couple of things happening. You're right. And and I when I talk about um, the the nuance of say the Amazon Go experience and that helping each other, obviously I think we're we're thinking about an environment where we we're not necessarily bringing COVID into that picture. Once we bring COVID into the picture and we're thinking about the world as it is right now and will be for you know you know perhaps a few years even at this point, we do have to think about what contact list looks like and what social distancing looks like in all of these types of experiences: the live experience, the work, the play, the shopping, all of these things. So yeah, so there is certainly, um, th that becomes a, a different set of equations. And the, the uh, trade-off, as you say, of you know, being able to do Zoom calls with people instead of meeting for coffees or things like that, um, there's, a, there's a, uh, a weakening of the tie that happens. I think you know, we rely so much on our sensory parts of our experiences in order to have mo the most meaningful experiences. So being able to be in person with someone and having that coffee or whatever is, is definitely a different kind of experience, as we all know, from sitting across a screen you know, from someone. But you're right, they're, they're also more efficient and we can cram a lot more of these you know, Zoom meetings into the day and we don't, we don't have to necessarily generate uh, the same level of carbon emissions when we are meeting with people who are in other parts of the world. So you know, it, it does cost a little bit of carbon to you know, have a uh, computer footprint, you know, having the computer turned on and, and connected to the internet and all of that, but it's not flying. It's not flying internationally. So there's definitely these things that we have to weigh into the overall picture. But I think just from a human experience standpoint, it's important to be able to, to acknowledge that there are things that we can do when we're uh, dealing with the virtual realm that we can't do with fidget, physical, <laughs> that word fidgetal. I don't know how many of you have run across this um, hybrid word of physical and digital that people sometimes use, and I, I actually hate it, <laughs> didn't mean to say it, <laughs> but yeah, so the virtual versus the physical, and then we need to think about what are the benefits to that. I, I think actually um, George said it in his opening video, uh, or, or maybe it was Peter, one, one of the two said something about like what, what are going to be the benefits that we have when we're using these virtual formats, and how can we lean into those for the time being. I don't think that virtual meetings and Zoom and that sort of thing is going away 
even once there's widely available vaccine and we're in a whatever returning to sort of the safe post COVID state looks like. I think that we're going to have learned a lot about how to effectively have virtual relationships and virtual business. And that's going to remain in parallel as we resume a lot of the, the physical activity. So I think it's important for us in thinking about what sort of digital transformation looks like uh, from a business standpoint and from a community standpoint that we do continue to invest in these virtual realms and that we, we're you know, up to speed on what these platforms can do for us and, and what, what's good about them. And then, you know, also be very much looking forward to the chance to return to uh, our physical selves and, and being in person in proximity with one another. Lots of questions coming in, Kate. Oh, it's, okay. It's nice to see people so engaged. We All were right. supposed to be off by 9.30, but I've just got a note here from the organizers. How about two more questions? Do you have time for that? Right. Sure, of course. Okay. Uh, this Thank is a you. question from Scott Harrison <laughs> from the town of Qualicum Beach, a lovely place uh, up island. Uh, how much of the future of work and technology will be automated? Uh, like program writing skills, licensed software tools, and what skills should we be focusing on to prepare workers for that future? Well, I think, Scott, it's, it's a really good question, and it's impossible to, to give a blanket answer for that. But I think it's, it's really wise, I think, to think about most tasks moving toward automation. And as I mentioned earlier, I think what that means is as more tasks become automated, <clears throat> the sort of scope of jobs, <clears throat> sorry, the scope of jobs that shape around those tasks shift. And so we need to think about moving human workers toward more nuanced skills. All of the skills that we learn as soft skills, like project management and delegation and coordination and communication and all those kinds of things are all going to continue to matter. Like we need that in the workplace. When we're thinking about managing combined teams of humans and, and machine sort of resources, automated resources, it's going to be important that humans are doing the nuanced work, that we're making judgment calls, that we understand how to evaluate context. You know, I saw a, qu a question earlier that I can merge into this, which was about, you know, the, the mention I made of, of adding value uh, and, and what that means in practice. And so I think you can look at an example like in a call center, an awful lot of the calls that come in, let's say for a bank or for any kind of institution, a lot of the calls or emails that come in are about, say, things like password changes, or I can't, I can't get into my account. And what's easy is to be able to automate that sort of that process in many cases. And I've seen a lot of success with clients and, and companies that I advise when they move toward automating those types of interactions. The, the most basic, fundamental types of questions that people tend to ask, which are, by the way, the most frustrating and limiting for the people on that outside, you know, customer sort of side of the equation, and are the least rewarding for the person who's answering phones or answering emails. There's no nuance to that. But what you do is then you move the people who have been answering those questions into the more emotionally agile kinds of things. Like, you know, I need to close this account because, you know, I'm, I'm going, going through a divorce and I need to figure out how to make sure that my accounts are separate or that there's some sort of human need for capacity of understanding or understanding judgment or, or context. Those things are very different from here's how to access the form that will provide you with your password. So I think that's the kind of thing that we need to be looking at is how do we, how do we separate tasks that are fundamental and have really no uh, sort of emotional attachment to them versus the ones where we can imbue more of a sense of meaning and value by being more human in those roles and continually adding value and upvaluing those kinds of skills. Uh, thank you. One more question for you. I will say Alana uh, made a... Uh... Great comment, I thought. She says, obviously, uh, you haven't spent a lot of time on the island because this is utopia. Uh, <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> referring to your dystopia, utopia, are you? Which is, uh, I like that, Alana. That is fantastic. We are lucky to live here. New York's great, too. But it's pretty great. But yeah, I'd love to see your island. You can come you to my island anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. And again, yeah. thank you for going over. Um, Time's just flying by. This is from Barry, and I think this is a good question. He says, what, what is your opinion on the movement for a universal social dividend to tax global tech companies and create a global universal income from this, this fund? Do you agree with that idea? And, and if you do, do you think that's uh, realistic? Yeah, I think it's a really good question, and it's one that I've gotten into in a few other places, and it's probably going to take a longer time than, than I have. But in, in short, I think that it's one of many possible answers. I think it is an ex a, a solution worth exploring. 
Um, I, I don't know that it doesn't further some of the inequities that we, we already have, because I think what it, what it might do is further consolidate who holds power and wealth and how many people don't and don't have access to power and wealth. And so that, that worries me a little uh, about that solution. So I think it needs to be in combination with a concert of solutions, but I do think that it's something we need to be experimenting with on small scale and see how it plays out in small scale so that we can see how it might play out in larger scale at the provincial or state level or at the federal levels and, and in concert across nations, which I think ultimately would, would be the right solution if it's the right way to go. So I'm very curious to see um, models that play out with it. Um, I, I, again, I think the social implications are a little more complicated to unpack, but it's a really good question and a really good ponder. So I hope that you're doing further research on that as well. Thank you for that. Well, Kate, thank you for kicking off this uh, this year's summit. It was a great start. And to everyone who listened in and uh, provided questions, sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, we have to thank our sponsor for this presentation, Vancouver Island University. Thank you to them. Uh, I believe, Kate, uh, you were getting a gift in the mail from St. Jean's Cannery and Smokehouse. So right. <laughs> enjoy that, a taste of Vancouver Island. right? Yay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to mention to everyone here uh, that attendees can visit the exhibitors. Uh, the next session will start at 1230. Again, this is all online. And I'll be back with you uh, for the final presentation, the, the economic report on Thursday night at six o'clock. So enjoy this year's summit. Thank you for logging on. And Kate, uh, thank you for kicking things off. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. Have a great summit.